Synthesizing a Robust Ecotheology from Maimonides and the Kabbalah. The, the title was uh, Strange Bedfellows, but the truth is, for me, these, these realms are no longer strange bedfellows, and they haven't been for quite some time. Um, and we'll get into why they might be seen as strange bedfellows in a little bit. The question is, how can we overcome anthropocentrism in the Anthropocene? And what I'm proposing is a new and old Jewish ethics to help us and the Abra Abrahamic traditions become sources of blessing instead of sources of destruction. So first of all, I believe we need to start with an external measure of what constitutes good or sustainable ethics rooted in ecology. In other words, religion is not the measure of truth from the beginning of this presentation. But if that's true, why do we need the religious traditions at all? I hope to answer that question by examples, but in a word, religion deployed properly changes what we think and how we act in deep ways that are impossible for any other cultural system to accomplish. And religion can preserve deeply ecological truths from ancient times that are essential for recovering our full humanity. I want to underline also that this is specifically and especially true of Judaism because Judaism has its roots in an indigenous tradition in the land of Canaan, Israel, Palestine, whatever we want to call it. And those indigenous traditions, um, uh, in a way, uh, are, are subterranean to what we think of as Western monotheism, but actually they're the root and the source and the lifeblood of what those traditions have to say. So first, here's an example of what I think of as a good measurement. Ethical measurement would be to take, for example, Aldo Le Leopold's ideas, right? Um, I'm assuming people are relatively familiar, so I'm going to kind of skim through this, but the basic idea, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So we can use that as a measure to decide whether our religious values are giving us what we want to consider true or false. You know? So here's, I want to read something from the introduction to my book. Um, this is an explanation for what I think religion actually is for and what it does. Compassion arises naturally and spontaneously from the moment we encounter another. Moral reflection can extend the reach of that compassion even beyond the neighbor and beyond the span of a single lifetime. But our moral vision is too easily limited to what we can imagine in our mind's eye. Religion at its best serves to magnify the power of compassion and moral vision beyond the naked eye and the naked mind to extend it over hundreds or thousands of years. Religion can teach us how to act to preserve life far beyond the horizon of what any of us can calculate or plan for not just for one lifetime or generation, but for the proverbial gen seven generations, that is, for as long as any civilization will last. This truth is embedded in the Torah's plea to each person she addresses, choose life so that you and your seed will live. This is the foundation of the idea of covenant in the Bible. And it's essentially uh, and overwhelmingly equivalent to what we call sustainability now, even though their understanding of ecology would not have been um, comparable in many ways to ours. What they're talking about is essentially sustainability. Judaism has always viewed the world from a creation-centered perspective, and this is an essential foundation for an eco-theology. Creation is very good. That's the declaration at the end of Genesis 1. Even its very notion of time in biblical and rabbinic Judaism is structured around the weekly celebration of creation on the Sabbath. The Torah and the rabbis afterward lifted up the idea of original blessing the original goodness of creation, and found the purpose of our human existence in what happens here in this life world, and honored God both as creator and God's creation on the day of the Sabbath as good and holy. For modern ecotheology, especially as it has emerged in Christian circles, this notion of original blessing is an important starting point. Um, in Christian circles, it tends to be a counterpoint to the idea of original sin. We don't have that idea in Judaism, so we don't need to, do, to say that as a counterpoint. And so in a way, um, original blessing is all, almost presumed without needing to be spoken about. <clears throat> Finding redemption and salvation both within and for this world, as opposed to in a world to come, in rabbinic terms or in some kind of idea of heaven or paradise in other re religious terms. In this world, finding redemption in this world is the basis for right action and right living. These ideas point toward a holistic view of the earth and all life where redemption, the human good and moral value are grounded in the redemption and good of creation itself. The, route, the road toward healing this physical world and living responsibly and sustainably within it may depend on more fully developing this way of seeing holism as the ground of our morality. So I'm gonna go on a really brief tour of what the Bible has to say, or the Torah I should say. Um, 
and give you just some basic ideas. We're not going to go through all the text here, but first of all, uh, everyone thinks that the Torah is Genesis 1, and they read the first part, and then that becomes the um, it becomes a tone that sets that's set for everything else. And so Genesis 1, 28, 1, 26 to 28 becomes the meaning of everything. But in fact, there's a whole lot of Bible besides the, besides the first chapter of Genesis. And uh, there's a tendency to get stuck on that. And there's a question, why was that the first story that, they gave, that the, the biblical compilers gave us? They had a bunch of stories. They put the second one second. The things that come later are the more important ones, generally speaking. That is, the note you end on is the resolution of the music, not the note you begin on. It's important. So in the second chapter, it says the, the humans put into the garden, la'ovdo la'shamra, which is usually translated as to work her and keep her, but it actually means to serve her. La'avod means to serve and can also mean to worship, la'shamra, and to watch over her, to guard her. This is the human purpose and is explicit in, the chap in uh, chapter uh, two of Genesis. Every growth of the field would yet be in the land and every plant would yet grow because Adonai Elohim had not caused rain on the land and an Adam to serve the land was not. So the purpose of the human, the Adam, is to serve the land, the Adama. Is it the same as stewardship? No, because stewardship assumes that we are wise enough and good enough to control the earth. I'm going to skip the rest of this page here, although it's important. Also important, the first covenant that comes in the Torah is not with human, human beings, but with all life. All life, all animal life, all the world, all the land. The covenant is mentioned seven times in this section of Genesis 9, which emphasizes that this has to do with the restoring of creation and the goodness of creation. And the, fun, the fundamental reason for the covenant is that line in Genesis 8, I will not add to cursing anymore the ground for the sake of humanity. God says, I'm not going to connect the fate of the world with the fate of human beings anymore. This is a fundamental uh, de-anthropocentricizing, that's not really a word, of the, um, of the message of the Torah at that moment. Now, of course, things go back and forth. But ultimately, the covenant and the vision of the covenant is rooted in the Shemitah year, which is described as the time when we return to the, time, to the, to the Garden of Eden, but in an adult, um, real way. And that's what it means in the second paragraph here, you say, wild animals share the food with the people. That's what it says, the, sab the Sabbath of the land will be for you for eating, for you and your servants and your, your um, household and your strangers, your animals, and for the wild animal which is living with you. So it's a return to Eden where humans and wild animals and all animals are sharing the same food, which emphasizes that this is the point of the covenant, is to reach a society that can observe the sabbatical year, which of course is giving the land a full year of Sabbath every seven years. And then the 50th year, you may remember, if, you, if you're familiar, cancels all land transactions and every family goes back to its own original holdings, which need to be distributed equally at the beginning. Fundamental message is that we are all strangers and that we do not own the land. Finally, in the sabbatical year, the message in Leviticus 26 is that if you don't give the land its rights, then God will wipe out the people because the land comes first and the rights of the land come first. Now, there's not anything more clearly uh, like deep ecology than you could imagine than this message, which is you give the, the land its rights, you give the animals their rights, or you get wiped out. The covenantal part of this is not that you get to possess the land, it's that even after you get wiped out, God promises to give you a chance to restore the covenant and try again to do it right if you mess it up. That's the covenant means the ability to return from exile even after you've ruined the land because the land will have a chance to have its rest and restore itself. And then God will, because of the covenant, even if the human beings are not worthy, offer the human beings an, a chance to, re, to reclaim that relationship, to try to restore that relationship. Okay. That brings us to the bugaboo for everyone, which is Genesis 126. Elohim said, let us, or we will make a human, Adam, in our image, according to our likeness, and they will dominate or have dominion or exercise mastery over or among the fish of the sea, the bird of the skies, every beast over the land, over every crawler crawling on the land. And Elohim created the human in his image. In Elohim's image, he created him, male and female, he created them and blessed them and said to them, bear fruit and multiply, fill the earth, occupy or subdue her, whatever that means, it's unclear, dominate the fish of the sea, the bird of the sky and every animal. So it seems like we're in the image of God and that the point of the being in the image of God is that we have dominion. 
and that sounds like we can do whatever we want with the world. Let's remember, first of all, that the Genesis 2 comes after Genesis 1, as I pointed out, and in Genesis 2, dominion has only one feature, which is that the humans get to name the animals. There's no other thing that humans get to do. They can't eat them. There's no work to do, so they can't use them to do work. The Talmud says that the only thing it can mean is they use them to do work because they can't eat. But in the Garden of Eden, there is no work in that sense either. So all it means is that they can name the animals. And according to Midrash anyway, and this tells a lot about the rabbinic mindset, uh, one of the things that it meant to name the animals is that the humans would call the animal's name and the animal would come to them, which is exactly the opposite of the kind of dominion that we exercise. And the kind of dominion that we exercise is what happens after the flood, which is, it's, as it says um, in Genesis, right? A fear and a terror of you will be on all the animals, which means they will run away from you. So it's the exact opposite of the dominion that's in Genesis 2 and 3. Okay. That's biblical Judaism in a nutshell. Now we have just half left to do the rest of my talk, which is the main point of the talk, which is going to be a challenge. But I feel like that's so important to go over. First of all, rabbinic Judaism went in radically anthropocentric directions. Not immediately, but by the 10th century, you have Sa'adya Go'on saying, when we see the many created beings, we should not be perplexed about what among them is the goal, for the goal is humanity. Now, it doesn't say that in the Torah. On the other hand, it's not inconsistent with one way of reading the Torah. So what we have is a worldview uh, in the Torah, which is defined loosely enough that it's open to very vastly different interpretations. But the interpretations that are most anthropocentric are not necessarily the better ones or the truer ones. The fact that we don't agree, might not agree with them politically also doesn't make them false, but, it, but they're not essentially true or just because they've been believed in for such a long time. A later example of this modern example comes from Yitz Greenberg, who, by the way, I love and who does great work. But he says, in his example, an, an example of the interpretation of what the image of God means, infinite value, equality, uniqueness. These are the characteristics inherent in the very fact of being human. To know persons as they really are, to recognize them in all their distinctiveness is to know them as an image of God. It's a beautiful concept, right? But if humans have infinite value, then what does that say about the value of everything else around us? Because any, any infinite value trumps every other value. So that can't be the ground of our reality and our morality, even though it is an extraordinarily powerful foundation for human rights and things that we all care deeply about. So in other words, I mean to point out the part of, of the biblical traditions that is problematic for us from an ecological point of view also has its gifts and its holiness that we need to keep in mind when we're trying to figure out how all these things balance. The problem of God's image. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide because there's, there's uh, too much to do here, but I want to just give you this term, anthropoarchic. The idea is not that humans are at the center, but that humans are at the top and deserve to rule and use everything is different than anthropocentrism. And what we're going to move towards is an idea of um, weak, what um, some have called weak anthropocentrism, which is that humans are not at the top, but are in the center for a reason that is for the sake of the rest of creation, not for our own sakes. So what is the problem with God's image, though? It's not just because of the ecology and our modern politics. If we understand humans to be the only creatures in God's image, we isolate those qualities that set human beings apart. We ignore or subjugate the qualities we hold in common with other creatures. The idea of God's image therefore justifies not only the subjugation of other species, it also becomes an instrument for repressing those aspects of our own being that unite us with all life. So in other words, it doesn't matter whether there's an ecological crisis. This problem of theology is a problem for our humanity regardless of what kind of crisis we may or may not be in. And this is important to really understand, right? We also can't understand God if we only think God is that we are the image of God. If we think we're in the image of God and that kind of defines what God is, we have a, a totally impoverished idea of what the divine is, which we cannot, we cannot live with in a way that is healthy or life-giving, right? So for all these reasons, we need to transform our theology regardless of any environmental crisis. Okay, going on to Maimonides. We'll spend a few minutes on Maimonides, a few minutes on... Um, Kabbalah. So Maimonides is a 12th century premier philosopher and theologian of all Jewish history, perhaps an influential on both Jews, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. His most important work, Guide for the Perplexed, 
uh, espouses a model of the cosmos that parallels Gaia theory. He, set, he describes the universe as a living organic being. Know that the whole of being is one individual and nothing else that has the same status as Zaid or Omar. In other words, the same status as any person. These are just two common names floating around. Uh, uh, endowed with a heart and a soul. That's the, the, the creation. That's the, the universe that we're in. Because of this, one should understand that the one God has created only one being so that we know God's unity through knowing the unity of creation. So let's look at some of the ethical and metaphysical implications of this model. First of all, I want to point out, I forgot to point this out already. Sa'ad Yaga'on said, you shouldn't be perplexed. Nivuchim is the word in Hebrew. And the same works in Arabic because both of the, these works were written in Arabic in actuality. But the, the, the word is Nivuchim in Hebrew. You shouldn't be perplexed about the purpose of creation because it's humanity. Then Maimonides came and called his book the, the guide for the Nivuchim, the perplexed. And his point was actually, you should be perplexed. And Sa'ad is entirely wrong. As he says here, all the other beings have been intended for their own sakes and not for the sake of something else. If you consider the Torah, the notion we have in view will become manifest for with reference to none of the things created is the statement made in any way that it exists for the sake of some other things. It only says that the one brought every part of the world into existence and that it conformed to its purpose. This is what it means to say, and God saw that it was good. Good means um, intrinsically valuable, an end in itself. About the whole, God said, right? And God saw everything that God had made and behold, it is very good. So the very goodness of creation is the wholeness, the holism, the way it all interacts as a single living being. And it outweighs the goodness of any human beings. As he says, the value of, of the human in the individuals of the human species and all the more so all the other species is nothing compared to the whole of creation that exists and endures. Later, uh, later on in the guide, in a different uh, section of God, actually earlier in the guide, but... Um, he tries to explain what revelation Moses was given when he says to God, show me your glory. And God says, I will make all my goodness pass by you. All my goodness, according to Maimonides, means the goodness of creation itself, which is God's goodness. And that's why it says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it is very good. All this is about the very good creation and how it underlines an ethic. By their display, I mean that Moses would apprehend the nature of all the beings and the way they are mutually connected so that he would know how God governs them in general and in detail. I do not think we could come up with a better definition of ecology now in our time. Even though for him, ecology included how the planets influenced us and not just what happened on earth. In the same vein, he says, the human perfection in which a person can glory oneself is when one reaches God's apprehension according to their capacity, and they know God's providence over God's creation. This is what he was just talking about, how it operates in all the creatures coming into being and in their being guided and governed. This is what Moses' revelation was. So the degree that we can become perfect is the degree to which we can access some dimension of Moses' revelation about creation. The ways of such a person after such apprehension, what it means to understand creation in this ecological, what we would call ecological framework is that they would be directed continually toward loving kindness, righteousness, and justice to become like God's actions, to conduct themselves like God's actions. So this is, um, this is an extraordinary understanding of what it means to have that perception of creation, what we might think of as a scientific perception for him is a directly viscerally moral perception of creation. And again, this gets back to the very goodness of creation, which inspires our own goodness. As he says here, right, the, the world is built up of loving kindness. Everything that comes from God is called chesed, loving kindness. This reality as a whole is chesed, he says. God is that upon which the existence and stability of every form in the world ultimately reposes and by which they are constituted. Because of this, God is called in our language, in Hebrew, this is a liturgical term, cheha olamin, life of the worlds. The entire purpose of creation consists in bringing into existence the way you see it, everything whose existence is possible. In all these realms, in no way is, human, you, or is humanity the height or the center or the purpose of creation, even if humanity has a special per perfection, which is to understand this dimension of reality. It doesn't put us over reality. It gives us a privilege of just being in a way Literally standing under reality to understand. 
So he rejected anthropocentrism, espoused a holistic cosmology, which are starting points for any ecotheology. He has problematic aspects too, though, because he's a strict Aristotelian, which means he did not like the sense of touch. He thought imagination was problematic and that you can't know truth through imagination. And very interestingly, one of his examples of a crazy thing you could imagine is an iron ship flying through the air, which just kind of proves how wrong he is about imagination since we in fact have iron ships flying through the air, more or less. So um, he gives us the foundation for overcoming anthropocentrism, but he doesn't give us a foundation for bringing our imagination and our passion. That is the kind of passion that works for people who may not be deeply philosophical but who have a visceral sense of nature and what we mean by nature. <clears throat> we need other dimensions of theology in order to get us there. And I'm almost out of time. So what do we do about that, Catherine? Do I have an extra five minutes or not? Couldn't hear you. Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> yes, go on. Okay. So now we're gonna get into just a little bit of Kabbalah. Um, fundamentally, the Kabbalah understands that the purpose, and we're talking about from the 11th century on, because Jewish mysticism is sometimes uh, the, what is meant by Kabbalah, which means all Jewish mysticism. But when we talk about Kabbalah, now I'm talking specifically about the tradition that begins with Sefer by here in the 11th century, reaches its, its, uh, one of its climaxes in the Zohar and continues until this day, specifically has the belief that the purpose of the commandments is to bring blessing not to the Jewish people, not to humanity, but to all creation and to all beings. And that any action that we do should have and serve that purpose. The word in Hebrew is that it increases, the sh every mitzvah increases the commandment, increases the shefa, the abundant flow that comes into the world. As Seth Brody wrote, I'm going to the bottom of this slide, the Kabbalah's goal is to become a living bridge uniting heaven and earth so that God may become equally manifest above and below for healing and redemption of all, meaning all creatures, all beings, all realms, all worlds, we could say all ecosystems. The Bahir, the sort of originary text of this way of seeing Jewish mysticism, talks about how there was a king building a palace and as he hewed out the rocks, a gushing spring came forth and he said, I'll plant a garden and, that will, and then I will delight in it and so will all the world. That's the metaphor for creation in the Bahir, which is God is surprised and delighted and wants to share playfulness by creating a world that can enjoy that playfulness. The Bahir also describes um, the tree of life as being the thing that's built, that's planted out of this fountain. And this is, this is a diagram of the tree of life that comes from my book. Um, you may be familiar with, the, with this uh, picture, but basically all these different potencies or powers represent ways in which God relates to the world and ways in which God relates internally to God. And each of these corresponds to different levels of divinity so that something can be true about the divine at one level, but not true at another level. And that creates a very complicated hermeneutical system, which is actually essential for the kind of complex truth that we need, which is a truth essentially that says we are not the center of the universe. We are just another species. And yet we are the center for the sake of the idea that we need to serve all other species. So those two ideas being held together, they contradict each other, but they don't contradict each other levels of reality at which there are different kinds of truth. And that's one of the things that Kabbalah does brilliantly, is to give us this idea. Zohar says, all who wound God's works wound God's image, and the name Adonai does not rest on a wounded place. So we remember God's image is the thing that's supposed to put human beings above all creation, but here God's image is that which is found in creation itself. And this is what we see as a pattern within Kabbalah in general. Here's a brilliant thing I'm going to go over really quickly. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, go over it in detail. Everything comes from the 10 spherot, that diagram, the combination and recombination of all those powers, whether it's rock, plant, animal, human, every one of them is in the structure of God's seal, says Yosef ben Shalom Ashkenazi, who we're talking about 13th, 14th century. We're not really sure when he was. That means in God's image, everything, rock, plant, animal, human, this hints at the truth. It says, let us make an Adam in our image as our likeness. And it says, the heavens rejoice and the earth sings out. This is a brilliant and crazy interpretation, which we're going to go over here, okay? The first letters of this word, of this phrase, the heavens rejoice and the earth sing out, spell out yud heh vav heh, God, God's names. And the last letters spell out God's image, Salmo. Here's what it looks like. You see the blue letters are God's name. Oops, did not mean to switch. 
The blue letters are God's name and the, the red letters spell out God's image. So the heavens rejoice and the earth sings out is God's image. And it is that which is put into human beings. And that's what it means to say, let us make an Adam in our image. It means makes it, let us make an Adam in the image of, of, of God that is the creation itself. And that's a trope that repeats in Kabbalah repeatedly. And um, then we get to Kabbalistic ethics. And this is going to be one little taste of this. And then we're going to end so we have time for discussion. Okay. So Moshe Cordovero, who says, um, the purpose is to make life stream forth to all beings. That's the purpose of our existence. Okay. He says, uh, I can't go through all this in, in detail, but a person's compassion needs to be distributed to all creatures in order to be imitating God's actions because God is merciful to all creatures, not destroying them and not despising them. Therefore, you can't uproot a growing thing or kill an animal unless you need and you must choose a good death for the creature that you need to show mercy however is possible. This is the principle. Compassion should be over all existence to not hurt them unless it's to raise them from level to level, higher to higher, from growing to living, from living to speaking. Very anthropocentric. On the one hand, on the other hand, if you have not considered the destiny of the soul of that animal or that plant, and all things have souls in Kabbalah, then you have sinned against the plant or the animal, against creation, against God, and against yourself. And so we have an anthropocentric ethic, which is at the same time can be deeply uh, ecologically inspired. Moshe Cordovero, by the way, I didn't put this in the slides here, uh, also says that um, you shouldn't kill, if you have a, like rats in your, in your barn, your silo, you can't kill them just uh, like with poison or something like that. You can't kill them with your own hands. You have to kill them by bringing a cat to eat them because that's the natural order of things. So that way chesed comes through the action. That is loving kindness comes because God feeds the cats. So you can't just kill things because they're bothering you. You have to put the, he's just essentially talking about biodynamic, you know, pest control. It's quite amazing. He also says that, he also uses the term amita yafa. Oops, where was that? You have to give a good death for them. And that phrase in the Talmud is only used for how you carry out execution in capital punishment in the case of human beings. And it's an instantiation in the Talmud of the verse, love your neighbor as yourself, is that if you're going to meet out the death penalty, you must do it in a way which is, not painful and not disfiguring. And he applies this to animals. So what he's always doing, also doing without telling you that he's doing it is that he's applying the, the, the mitzvah, the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself to the animals. This is all coming out of Kabbalah. Now there's so much more to go in here. Just gonna read this one idea, cause it's cool. From the moment that it arose in thought to, and speech that there would be nature, then only then was the place, the thing that we call, that we think of as God called Elohim, called God. So God can't be God unless there's nature. And since all of nature is included in Adam, behold, that's what it means to say God, that the Adam, the human, is in Elohim's image, is in God's image. Okay, there's so much more to talk about. That's enough for now. <clears throat> that's a co that's a, the cover of my book. And I will stop sharing now. And thank you for listening to me. <laughs>